Imagine a mad scientist slapping a bunch of animals together with duct tape. Is it a bird? Is it a beaver? Or is it maybe even an alien from another world? Well, get ready, inquisitive humans, because we're about to learn a little bit about the platypus and figure out where the hell it came from on today's episode of Comedic Matters. What's even funnier? I just prepared for this yesterday and my guests have no clue what's about to happen. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Comedic Matters, the podcast where my friends and I learn a little bit about weird topics, ponder life's most interesting questions, and definitively answer them without any qualifications to do so. So strap yourselves in, keep your arms and legs inside the right at all times, and prepare yourself for the Comedic Matters podcast. On today's show, we have the Baconator, Kate. Say hello, Kate. Hello. And somebody new to the show, somebody who might very well be a beaver, Cody. Hello, Cody. Hello. I may or may not eat lots of wood. Oh, that's your response to the allegations? (laughs) Wow. Yeah. All right. (laughs) All right. Cody is definitely a beaver. All right. So it's, it's now time, panel. It's time to figure out today's question. Today's episode, we will finally answer, is the platypus an alien creature that did not originate on Earth? This is image one. That's platypus. You can see it, right? You can see it on the screen. What's your initial reaction to seeing the platypus in a frozen state when it's looking at you through your soul? What's your reaction? What what is that thing? It looks like it's try it looks like a duck that like got lost and forgot that it was a duck. Yep. So there might be part duck in it. Cody, what other things does it look like to you? Or what are you thinking? Um I'm thinking it, it looks like the like the front of it was like sewed on like it was like a taxidermist yes. uh, rat, almost, mm-hmm. uh, with a duck face. Yes. It looks put on there with like some some silly putty or duct tape. Yep, absolutely. So let me tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll move on to some more interesting parts about it. But the platypus is a small, amphibious Australian mammal, so it's got that going for it already. Because I know lots of things in Australia can kill you. It can. We'll get to it. It definitely can. All right, and it's known for... It's odd combination of primitive features and special adaptations that no other creature has. So no other creature has the combination that this screwed up thing does, which is the evidence that I think it could be an alien. I'm not going to tell you where I'm falling, but it very well could be. So it is a mammal. When we cut it open and we look for the little tag inside of a ma- in there, it says mammal, you know, like 34 size pants. It says mammal inside of its guts. Um, it's got special adaptations, but it's mostly known for this bill, right? The the weird looking bill, almost like a bowling ball. You can put your fingers in its nose. And like you said, it's almost like a duck got its bill ripped off and it got sewed on to a beaver. That gives me an idea for a business, platypus bowling alley. Ooh, would they be alive or dead? I think it would be duck pin bowling. Duck pin. Ah, I like that. I think you could have both a live and dead version, probably, Kate, for people who want to be nice to the platypi. Mm-hmm. All right. This thing's entire history is based on mystery. We're not quite sure how exactly it came to be. We weren't there. But it also has a history of confusing the hell out of human beings. So the first time a Westerner saw this thing, We thought it was fake. We thought it was a forgery, exactly like you both kind of talked about it. According to Ripley's, a zoologist named George Shaw was the first person to witness a platypus, or first Westerner, and that's all that counts, right, in history books, Westerners. Um, When the pelt of this thing and a bill was sent to him in almost 1800, and he, he looked at it, he analyzed it, and he really thought he was being duped. So the first time somebody who studied science, saw this thing, thought it was a forgery. Anything come to mind when you hear that? I can see why. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. According to Britannica, another weird thing about it are the little patches under its eyes. See those little football player-esque paint splots? It's almost like it paints itself and it gets ready to go for the game. Is there a platypus football league? 
There better be. If not, let's patent it. Let's do it. Cody, do you have any connections there- with the NFL? Can we get anything going? Are there any underground platypus fight clubs? I believe so. I think Meatloaf was in it, the singer. That's what killed him. Oh, did he get like stabbed by the poisonous uh, yeah. uh, glands of the platypus? Did you know that? Because we're going to get to that. We're going to definitely get to that. So look at this <laughs> thing. It's got the fur of an otter or beaver, the bill of a duck. It's staring into my soul. Let's learn a little bit more about it. All right. Does this look any different to you? This is another platypus. That looks fake. Nope. That look that looks like some moldy bread I've eaten in college. <laughs> it's totally real. And the other message is when you see multiple platypi, when you see platypuses, a lot of them look different from each other. They're unique. This one's clearly been stuffed, right? This one's not alive. Yeah. This one's not alive anymore. But um, so the early settlers of Australia actually called this some other things before it got stuck with the name platypus. You let me know if these sound any better. Duck mole. You like duck mole? Water mole. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I can see why they would call it that. Water mole or duck bill. That one's kind of redundant to a duck's bill, but. Yeah. And they kept that because they named it, isn't it like called the duck billed platypus? They did. They did. So you'll see the naming of this is just as confusing as what it looks like. Now, the Aborigine people who saw this way before a Westerner, uh, they they knew that this thing existed because they saw it, but um, they were also kind of confused by it. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't really have a good name for it. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit Bob. later. But They should call it Bob. Bob. Bob the platypus. Platypatty? Platypeat. So sci- scientists get to it. 1799, George Shaw looks at it, and he names the animal Platypus ana. Tinus, platypus anatinus, not anus, Cody. Don't get excited. <laughs> anatinus. Does sound like it's saying that it has a tiny anus. Tiny anus. <laughs> Duck build tiny. I mean, tiny anus freak show. Do they though? Uh, technically yes. And I'm going to show you that. <laughs> now, what that means, platypus anatinus means flat-footed and bird-like. So its name, flat-footed bird-like. That's what. George it Shaw doesn't have wings. That's what George Shaw thought was important. The hmm. bird-like qualities to so, it. So this is like the original man bear pig. Yes. Yes, it is. Mm. Yes. All right. But it gets even more confusing because that name didn't work at the same time. Almost one of those like two people coming up with the same idea at the same time. There was a German scientist named Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, which is like the goddamn most German name I think I've ever heard in my life. He was working independently and he named it the Ornithorhynchus paradoxus, the puzzling bird-billed animal. So he too thought that the bird bill was important enough to put in the name. Do you think they were both high? Were they both I Just, think everyone was high in that time period. They were all they? on ether, I think. Ether frolics. Yeah. Um, so here's where it gets even more confusing. You have two names, Platypus anatinus and Orinthonorcus paradoxus. But however, so the, the way that the naming works is it's supposed to be the first scientist who names it technically, right? And that's where it comes from. But they find out that George Shaw's name, Platypus, had already been given to a weevil. So there's a weevil that's called the platypus? Back then, there was a weevil named the platypus. And in its, you know, species name, platypus. Yep. Is so, it extinct now? Because you said back then. Oh, I meant, sorry. Back then, it was commonly just referred to as platypus. You know, like we called the platypus the platypus bite, but not its, like, species name. So are these little weevils, like, miniature platypi? Yep. There are also freak shows. They have a combination of spiders and rhinos. Whoa. It's a rhino. We have to do a podcast on those. Okay. They're definitely aliens, but I wasn't sure about the platypus. So that's why I made this a topic. So because the weevil already had its name, they had to take parts from both of the names of the scientists who were working on it, and they called it the Ornithorhynchus anatinus. So they 
bird-like animal. They stuck with the bird thing. They got rid of the flat foot thing. They got rid of the other components. They just stuck with the bird-like animal. So even but the- don't both of those mean bird? So isn't it just calling it like a bird-like bird? Yes, a bird-like bird. It's very redundant. But it, I mean, I don't know what the platypus does, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't fly. It, it might. I'm going to, I'm going to try to prove that or show you evidence of that maybe a little later. So oh, this, okay. this thing can't even come to terms with its own name, right? It can't even get its name straight. <laughs> Here we go. This, this is important, Cody. It's related to your anus question. I figured you'd be very interested in the anus based off of some evidence I found. Um, I'll show, I'll show the audience that very shortly, but this thing is named a monotreme. I think so, that's how you say it. Monotreme. That's a type of animal. It is, it's basically one hole to rule them all. So it's like Lord of the Rings, but about anuses. So these are egg laying mammals and they get their name, the monotreme from the one hole they have that is both their anus and their genital opening and the place where they pee. So it's where they do the naughty stuff and the, the dirty stuff or both types of dirty stuff. Now they also do have a mouth, right? Or do they eat through this? They, one hole they also well? eat when they're specifically eating sugary substances, they shove it, shove it right into their cloaca. So they're eating oh, okay. to Tootsie Rolls or candy bars that goes in the cloaca. But so when they're, they're eating, very bird-like in that sense. Yep, Absolutely. All right, that was a lie. If I get a question that I asked, uh, I'm asked that I don't know, I lie. Uh, so the monotreme, it's a Greek word and it means mono hole, single hole, monotreme. It's actually the, the defining quality that makes this thing so unique that it gets classified as something, that there are only two animals that exist in the world that are like this at all. Um, so I'll get to that in one minute, but it's a mammal. Are you the other one? I'm the other one. Absolutely. I put, I'm pouring the seltzer into my mouth. When I drink sugary stuff, it goes into my cloaca. <laughs> yep. I think that's, I think that's how prisoners, uh, ingest, uh, substances too. So think about what this means in, a, in, in other, in other animals where you usually have two holes for different things or two different locations in your body. This thing has to fight over one hole. Right. So not only are the scientists fighting over the name, but it's holes and it's bodily functions are also kind of fighting with each other. So I thought this was fitting. I don't know which one of those you want to represent poop and which one represents sex. Take your freedoms with that. I don't know, but one hole to rule them all. Here's another picture of its cloaca. All right. This is for you, Cody. Nice little posturing of the cloaca. I don't, I don't want to point to it because that might be too aggressive, but I will circle it. It's right there. All right. So that's the cloaca. Oh, I've seen everything now. You have. Now what comes out of that cloaca other than their genitals and other than their poop and pee? Eggs. Now I, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't have eggs. Kate, I do. They're in you, my refrigerator. You have eggs. Have you ever laid them? Uh... I mean, I, I lay them on the shelf in on my refrigerator shelf. after I bring them home from the store. All right. But they, they never come out of your body and you never put them in a nest of twigs or no, anything like that? No. no. All right. Cody, have you ever laid an egg? Um, I don't believe so. All right. But I have thrown up eggs before. Okay. All right. So you're not a platypus. There are only two types of egg-laying mammals left on the planet today. The duck-billed platypus is one, and the echidna is the other one, the anteater, right? This The spiny anteater. Uh, so these are both the monotremes, and both of them were like the kings of Australia for a long time until kangaroos and marsupials came around and kicked them out. So the, they, were, they, they were dominant over Australia, but the marsupials came there and kind of push them into a small pocket of Australia, I think, from what I've read. This is according to Scientific America. So you can blame the kangaroos for these things not being more prevalent. I've never encountered one. I've looked. I've looked under rocks. I've looked in streams around here. They're not here. Not in the United States. They never were. I've seen lots of pictures of them, though. So pictures of them do exist. Pictures exist. But they might always be Photoshopped. I never, never trust that. 
uh, according to Charlie Wilcox at National Geographic. So that's legit, right? I need to tell you a little bit about what the females do. So they seal themselves off into a burrow. They lay their eggs. The mom usually makes one or two eggs at a time and keeps them warm. If they're feeling productive, they put that many eggs out. But she warms them between her body and her tail. She kind of cups them like a nice little jock strap made out of a tail. Keeps them warm. And the eggs hatch about 10 days later. And they're about the size of lima beans when they come out. So a little lima bean platypus. Cody, if they sold pickled baby lima bean platypi, would you eat them? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I would, I would try it. I would try it. I'd be, I'd be curious how, um, how uh, developed their bones are. Right. Because I feel like that would be the most off-putting thing. Like it's yeah. like anchovies. But but wouldn't that be cruel to to the baby platypus? It would. We'd only have to eat dead ones. I think ones okay. that right. died of natural causes. That'd be better. All right. I just, mean, if rich people can have caviar, yeah. why can't we have? Uh, Platyar. Platyar. Maybe the, the really wealthy people do, and we just don't know about it because we're not there. We're not members of the elite. People of YouTube, no. if you watch enough of our podcast, then we might be able to taste Platyar and let you know what it's like. All right. Just a fair warning to both my panelists. Brace yourself because things are about to get even weirder. That's right. Weirder brace. is coming. Brace. Brace. These things don't have teats. They're mammals, and they don't have boobies. No way to get the milk to their young. All right? No But then what do the male platypi- platypuses look at? Uh, the cloaca. All of their pornography okay. and neurotica is all based on that cloaca. So here's what they do instead. They sweat their milk. And this is a little game we called Is Matt Lying? Do platypi really not have boobs? And... <laughs> Do they really leak their milk out of their own flesh? Is Matt lying? I think you're telling the truth. I guess I have to I guess I have to guess that you're lying then because that seems like a defining trait of mammals. Ah. All right. So Kate Cody, you both have similar sounding names even though they're spelled with different letters. Cody no, the audience is laughing at you, Cody. You're being mocked. You first show with us, and they're mocking you, Cody. And to Kate. Congratulations, Kate. Matt was not lying. Thank you. So, yes, platypuses do not have nipples. They do not have teats. They do not get their milk that way. They're actually secreted through their pores, and it collects on little grooves on their abdomen. And it goes down those little V-lines to their babies drinking the milk. That's weird, isn't it? Did you know that, Cody? Did you know that they did that? I did not know that. Do they have to... So is it just the female platypi um, after, like, post-egg laying that they can do that? Or, like, every time they work out or, you know, break a sweat, Ah. they get all milky yeah that gym platypus gyms would be even more disgusting than human gyms right you just have curdled, yeah, I mean, imagine if humans did that that would be really gross curdled milk on the the weights and the treadmills but if you had a particularly unhealthy one that was sweating a lot it'd be like a tsunami of milk splashing backwards off of the off of the treadmill i'm disgusted at this let's move on all right let's move on to something something else Something else. Matt, that reminds me of a scene in your book, Andy Gets Conned, which our viewers can buy on Amazon.com. Kate, I love that plug. I love that. I love that plug. Thank you. Yes, audience. It's available on Amazon. I'll sign it if you find me. Uh, let's move on to this. What's going on here, folks? That's right. It's time to talk about <laughs> platypus romance. That's right. All right. So let's look. Let's look at what they do, first of all. And then we'll then we'll get to what how exactly it works. So you're getting it from behind there. You're getting it from the side. You see that? And right there, a little nibbling on the old tail, a little bit of foreplay. Getting weird, isn't it? 
This one is so <laughs> so into it that he's doing a rock, I believe so. This is platypus self-pleasuring. Uh, the youth are even into it, so this is not illegal in the platypus world. And as Cody knows, um, Cody's very much into it. Cody's got some problems. Um, they're often in big groups when they do it. So let's let's move let's move on. Let's move backwards, please. All right, Cody, do you remember that picture? You looked a little out of it in that picture. Uh, yeah, what were you on at the time? A bench, um, clearly, but. I was drinking that platypus milk. <laughs> That'll do it. Um, so let's go back a bit. <laughs> little is known about what actually drives the sexual selection in platypuses. So females don't seem to be that picky when it comes to choosing a mate, which is interesting to the animal world. Yet another oddity, you know, usually our males are fighting with each other and the biggest one always wins. Not so much in the platypus world. It's kind of who's by, who's close by. So teenage Matt, probably teenage Cody, would have been very happy in the platypus world. Because, you know, humanity doesn't work that way all the time. Uh, so females in captive seem to court and mate with anybody in captivity with anybody who's nearby. Now, is that just platypuses or do they mate with like, like, will they mate with ants or beavers oh. or ducks? Uh, I did find that one with the rock. So I believe mm -hmm. that they'll do anything nearby. Okay. Yeah. They do experience courtship. So there's some romance. It's a bit of a dance, one scientist said. Males will try to court by biting the female's tail. So that's what this one is. It's courtship. So Kate, you know, when I was, when, when we were, when we were courting each other and I was trying to win you over, you're trying to win me over, you know, we were trying to be interesting. Yes, I, and, I remember you, you biting my tail. Well, oh, and, okay. And that got me. Well, this is what, I, I didn't know that I was stealing a move from the platypus world, but apparently I was. But if the lady's not into it, she will not reciprocate in the tail biting and the male will actually respect it no matter how horny he is. So they're pretty progressive in the platypus world. So do they bite the tails at the same time when they're eating some kind of platypus tire <laughs> in which they start spinning uncontrollably? Yes. When they're both into it, they can both be used as road travel devices. Yep. And then they'll take their time. So if the lady's not into it, she might go off into a neighboring pond and then the dude will kind of just chill out and wait. And then she'll come back when she's ready, if she's ever ready, right? She'll probably go chat with her well, platypus. If she doesn't come back, will, will the male go bite another female platypus's tail? Yeah, or he'll bite his own tail or get one of his buddies <laughs> drunk and dare him to bite his tail. It it gets pretty desperate in the platypus world. Are there some like uh, uh, some like platypus ads that he can call and mm -hmm. hire a a platypus escort yep there are there are plenty of those in my research i looked through them i didn't test them out i figured i didn't want to go to jail for it <laughs> now this picture is relevant it's not just to uh, poke at cody but to copulate the male will climb partially onto the female's back so see like the one with the big smile he's getting ready to climb onto the back he'll curl his tail under her abdomen right? Because they got to get their cloacas close to each other. So think about this, even if you don't want to think about it. Sorry, audience, if you're eating breakfast or something, but you got to curl that tail under there. You put the penis out of your cloaca into her cloaca, and then it can last about 10 minutes. So that's according to live science. I'd hate to be the scientist who had to dedicate their lives to that study though. Could you imagine that? You used to spend months watching platypuses just do it. They could be into that, though. Yeah. You know, they, think about all yeah. the farmers that uh, personally test out um, the uh, flexibility <laughs> of the, the farm animals. Yes. Just, you know, just to learn, right? It's really complex. But once they do it, they got to have some babies, right? If my mom were a platypus, I don't know about you, but I think that would be extreme nightmare fuel if I found out my mom were a literal <laughs> platypus. But this is apparently yes. a kid's book. So that kind of 
That amused me. It looks me. like it won a lot of awards, too. Look at that. Once they have the baby, it leads to now, something even more confusing. wait a minute. You said that, that platypuses live, live in Australia. So why are there African animals on the cover of this book? Um, it's a great question. This platypus is lost. Clearly, okay. <coughs> it's lost. It kind of looks like uh, it might be... It looks very similar to the orangutan or other monkey-like animal that's right. swinging. Right. up there so i gotta imagine this is like some sort of platypus facing mm, uh yeah in which in yeah. which an animal <laughs> is uh making fun of platypi yeah. by dressing up as them unfortunately the cancel culture in the platypus world is even worse than ours you know it's pretty extreme yeah you have to be careful now let me tell you about what one scientist says is the weirdest thing about the platypus so it's not the bill it's not how they do it. It's not their cloaca. It's not sweating milk. It's this. Now, this one doesn't sound as weird to maybe the layman like us, but listen. Humans and other mammals, let's talk about chromosomes a second. We only have two sex chromosomes, right? X and Y, right? And the we use an XY system. If both of them are an X, you're a lady, you're a female. And if one is an X and one is a Y, you get male. And that's really all what the... What if you get two Y chromosomes? Uh, I don't. I I don't think you can. Can you? I don't think nature allows that. Well, well, if if you have two dads, if you have two dads and they both give their specimen into one cup and then somebody puts it yep. into outer space, I think you can get two Ys. But that may have been a dream, and not my research. So you get one of those from your mom, one from your dad, and then it determines your female male status, right? Now, birds, which the platypus are related to, they have a ZW system. I'm not too familiar with that. Reptiles have an XY and a ZW system, so they all have their own. But the platypus is the weirdest. Platypi have 10 sex chromosomes. So it's Does that mean that there are 10 different platypus genders? Well, even more than that, because I'll get, I'll get to that in one, one second. Yeah, you can combine it's them. I thought that, I mean, so it's not like humans where when you get extra chromosomes, bad things happen. Uh, it does. It, it does. It does. But these extra ones, nature has a weird way of dealing with the platypus. It's the largest number so far that we found in any mammal. So the platypus gets that. It's special in that regard. So a female platypus, this is the, I tried to break it down. So a female platypus will have five sets of X's. They'll have XX, both with ones on it. And then they'll have XX, both with twos on it. I'm serious. And then the males, they'll have five sets of XY's. So it's X1, Y1, X1, I mean, X2, Y2. It's really confusing. The inside that sounds of, like algebra. I know. Lots of math inside the platypus. Not only the mammal name, but also math equations. It's like the matrix when you look in their guts. Try that, people at home. Rip open a platypus, learn math. You heard, heard it here first. Uh, but listen to this. So when nature or the platypus god, whatever does this, instead of taking randomly from the males and the females, it takes only a certain pattern of, pattern of them to determine if it's a male or female. So it alternates. So if it takes like um, if it takes the first one from a female, it'll take the second one from the male. So it never can get the wrong combination. But if, if it were to work the way it normally works, scientist Ed, Ewan Bernie says, Ber Bernie, yeah, Bernie, Ewan Bernie says, in theory, it means there are 25 possible sexes for the platypus, but in practice, it doesn't happen. So even scientists are a little baffled by this because it's so weird. So how many platypus genders have actually been observed? Just two. Huh. Even though there could be. Then why of... do they have so many chromosomes? Well, if you want to be in the controversial camp that doesn't believe that platypi aren't aliens, those people, those conspiracy theorist people would argue that because they have so much genetics from the bird world, the reptile world, and the mammal world, they're like a missing link from a long, long time ago. They're an old species that they have all those weird chromosomes in them. So in order to survive, their body had to figure out, okay, that gender didn't work. That one just made them four bills and no legs. 
and they were eaten instantly, right? I don't know, but I just made that up. All right, here's another weird thing about the platypus. Their bills are magic. It gives them a sixth sense, not the Haley Jawsman movie, not that. Wait, it, so platypuses, they can't see ghosts? They can. They can see ghosts, apparitions, demons, Satan. I thought you said it wasn't that kind of sixth sense. It's not like the movie Sixth Sense. The oh, film, I see. But it is that Sixth Sense. It has thousands of cells in it. It's able to locate things even with its eyes closed or its ears blocked. Just using its little bill, it can pick up using mecha no receptors to detect not only pressure, so it can detect water pressure when it's underwater, motion, and electric signals of the muscles of its prey. That's Wait, a pretty interesting combination. What about, can it detect the David Bowie and Queen song? Yes. It can listen to any type of music. It's got Spotify Bluetooth connections in its bill. Great question, Cody. And Spotify, if you'd like to pick up the Comedic Matters podcast, we'll make a deal. So its bill is magic. It's also venomous. All right, so it's a venomous platypus. Cody, you were onto something. There's a calcinous spur. So if you look at the close up here, a little spur, and the spur is connected to a little tube, and the tube has poison in it. Oh. Uh huh. It looks like a little lima bean. It does. Like their like their baby. So is that like a little platypus baby poison inside of it? Yep, that is exactly what a platypus baby looks like. It's this weird alien like creature with a talon on it that could really screw up your day. Both male and females both have this talon, but the poison only comes out from the male. So the females don't get the poison. That seems like a shitty deal. I know. No equality. You have to lay the eggs and you don't get the poison. I know. Then you have to sweat milk. Yeah. So what's up? What's up there? Not fair. Not fair. The platypus female uprising must happen. There must be equality. So if a if a female platypus transitions to a male platypus, mm -hmm. do they then gain the venom? They don't. Or good question. Or not. They don't gain it immediately. They have to get a surgery, a corrective surgery that puts it in there. You got to get that sack put in you. But then once you do that, you're technically, you know, you're the same. So it works out. Uh, so these venoms are called DLPs, defense like uh, defensin like proteins. They're also unique to the platypus. There's about 80 different components or toxins in this venom. It's small enough to kill small prey, even up to like some dog sized creatures. So a, a tiny little platypus, they're only like this big, could take out like a dog. What like kind a chihuahua of or like a Great Dane? Uh, the research did not specify, so I will be funny and say it can wipe out the biggest dog you can imagine. It could wipe out Clifford, the big red dog. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. That's very, That's very big. Very yeah. big. Uh, so well, let's say you were, were to get attacked by a platypus. You probably wouldn't die as a human. There's been no reported deaths of a human from a platypus, but I always thought that was funny because if you died from a platypus, you wouldn't be able to report it, right? So that kind of makes sense. I, I thought that was how Meatloaf died. I think that is how Meatloaf died, I think. It is but my... he wasn't able to report it, yeah. so it's not Yeah, reported. it's not been reported. If you they're, were they're to covering get, it up. I think so. It's the next big conspiracy. Alex Jones, get on it. If you weren't not to die from it, you would experience some pretty devastating effects. Severe swelling, you know, edema, where your legs kind of swell up as if you were morbidly obese. Now, would it just swell in the spot where it, like, got you? Or would there be, like, or would, like, your whole body swell up so you'd become, like, this a giant, like, almost like a balloon? I wish it were that way, Kate, because that would be a lot funnier. But it's just the part that was bitten in the nearby areas. Now, if you were attacked by, an, not bitten, I mean scratched. If you were attacked by a group of platypuses and from some back alley, you know, then you'd swell up. So, okay. Okay. This is making sense. Yeah. Okay. Hypothesis time. Yeah. Okay. Um, in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Right. I think they were using platypus venom. Yes. In those blueberries, um, which is why Violet ballooned up into a giant blueberry. Good theory. I have read thoughts. Nobody's been able to back it up, but I like it, Cody. Get on the case. Not only swell, 
But there have been anecdotal evidence of people who have been scratched by platypuses, and they say the pain is more intense than any other pain they've ever felt. It actually, when you look at what it does, makes you more sensitive to pain. So the very venom makes you feel the pain even more. That's cruel. That's very cruel. So don't don't judge the innocent looking platypus by its cover. Uh, it can last for months. People have said that they've had increased sensitivity to pain only for months. So you don't get intense uh, sensitivity to eating cupcakes or doing it. Just pain. Just pain. Yep. All right, so let's get a little closer look at where this venom comes from. There's a little closer look. I know that might look disgusting or naughty, but there's the talon. It's produced in that curl gland that I showed you. It's in the hind limb of the males. And they're, like I said, no reported humans uh, getting killed, but humans who have been attacked by them. And they say, not only is the pain really bad, but the platypus requires manual disengagement. It means when that thing latches into you, it doesn't detach and run away. It stays in you like a fish hook. So you got to rip that sucker out. Is it like uh, how like the honeybee, like <laughs> it gets it gets stuck in you and then like you can like detach the poison no, thing the, or does it stay? So that it, it that doesn't break off. So it for some reason, though, it just latches on. It contracts its muscles and it doesn't want to let go. So it kind of looks so like you still got this huge platypus stuck to you. Yep. Yep. Well, not huge, but you know what I mean. Yep. So I can. Give I you... mean, much bigger in comparison to a. Bee. Yes. Yep. Why does that? Why does his hand thing kind of look like a like a piece of roast beef? I know it does, doesn't? It? I'm a little hungry right now, yeah. and that it does. It's got the right texture to look like beef. Uh, we're gonna get to something about that a little later too. Where are these where do these weird things live? Here is a scientifically proven image, a cross-sectional image that was taken in the wild in Australia of the platypus's den. All right. No, it's not. It's an artistic interpretation, meaning it could be wrong. But I bet he fucked those rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he got impregnated by those rocks. She did. And then she laid the eggs in there. Um, so they, they make their little burrow no. near water. Clearly. Now, yeah. wait a second. Going back to the venom, why is it that only the males have the venom? Uh, scientists didn't, they can't find God. So they've not been oh. able to ask. Okay. But, um. Do you think God is a platypus? Yes. I think South Park established that, right? I think mm -hmm. that's pretty fact. Yeah. That's canon, right? So I, I don't know, Kate. I have no idea why that only happens in the dudes. Probably because they do fight over women, even though the woman doesn't care. So that's kind of cruel too. They fight over the lady, but then the lady doesn't care. Ultimately, she'd do both of them, but they're too busy fighting each other with their poison talons. They live in little burrows, usually under near rocks, probably so they can do them or under roots, a sturdy place. They only come out at night, which is interesting. So they're kind of like ninjas. Here's platypus this, ninjas. Absolutely. Their waterproof fur lets them live near water. Like it looks like that water, if it were to even raise like a millimeter, it'd be flooded. I don't know if that'd be a good idea, but they can do that too. All right. Next weird f fact about the platypus. Their fur glows. All right. This is not an Ismat lying. I'm not playing the music. Over the centuries, different creatures have had different types of this biofluorescence where, you know, plants or fungi or fruits can light up under different circumstances, right? Or that the human eye can't perceive. So this is under ultraviolet light. You'll, you can see that, well, under visible light, this is what it looks like, right? I don't know why this one has a pencil jammed its, into its back, poor platypus, but that's what it normally looks like. But then under UV light, it looks like that. So pretty crazy, right? What do humans look like under UV light? Do uh, we, we don't. Glow? We don't look like anything. We just look like a big oh. hump of sadness. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so they're bizarre, even in other light forms. We can't figure out exactly why, because both the male and the female glow. And remember, at night they don't even need to see necessarily because they can use their bills. So it, it really doesn't make that much sense for them to stand out. It might even alert them to other predators. So scientists actually think that it helps them camouflage themselves from 
UV sensitive nocturnal predators because they observe they absorb the UV light instead of reflecting it. So it's like they have this little uh, cloak installed in them to block so, their so image. So it's like in Star Trek, they're able to cloak themselves. Yes. And be invisible. Yes. So let's can they cloaca themselves? Cloaca, I think they can. So let's do a brief review, right? You got a little bit of a reptile in these things. You got a little bit of a bird. And you got a little bit of a mammal. They're weird. They're a weird little sandwich kind of squished together. Speaking of sandwiches, what do they eat? Well, they're really, they really, they like little things. They like little crayfish and insects and worms. All right. They like to eat little things that they can find with their bill. They usually scan left and right along the bottom of the, the mud and they search for this kind of stuff. Pretty interesting, right? Here's something in action, right? It's a little platypus eating a worm. Wait a minute. That might. Maybe I got the cloaca hole wrong. Yeah, I think I think I did. Yeah, that's actually something else the platypus is doing. It's um, something I should probably blur unless I'm gonna want to get filtered by YouTube. No, all right. So this is a platypus eating a worm. It's not a penis. Uh, but the other weird part about the food part is that they don't have stomachs. Can you guess what they have from that last image? What they might have if they don't have a stomach? Cloaca. They do. Does it all just go like right, <laughs> like it just goes right through them? Yeah, they've all essentially had that uh, stomach surgery where their food just goes right to their colon. No, no, Cody, do, do you have a guess? A, do they have a smaller platypus inside them that eats the food? Another good guess, but no, no, not at all. All right. Here's what actually happens they have a gullet. You know what a gullet is? Do chickens have it? Yeah, the like top half of a guillotine. <laughs> ah, like a mullet. Mm, nice. Yeah. Uh, so it's instead of a stomach where you have like a sack with acids in it, they have this gullet instead, much like a bird. You know, you might be able to put some rocks in there, and that stuff grinds together, and it does the work for you. It's really weird. So they really, it's really weird. Scientists think that because it's such an old creature. Um, this developed in a different way. That's the best way I can say it. All right, but that that bill looks shockingly similar to a croc. Oh, like a foot? Yeah, like the shoe. Yeah, yeah. Not also kind of like a crocodile. Yeah, is that where the croc Maybe got the a shoe? Were modeled after the platypus. That needs to be an episode. I guess we need to do another episode on that. But they also eat Tim Tam bars. <laughs> you know what Tim Tam bars? Are? Let me get a little zoom in. No. Picture of a platypus. So Looks because like some they eat the wrapper too. Bar. Because I found I found this on the internet, it means it's true. So I did my research in the Tim Tam bar, as verified by this picture, is a brand of chocolate biscuit introduced by the Australian biscuit company Arnott's in 1964. Uh, it's two malted biscuits separated by a light, hard chocolate cream filling and coated in a thin layer of textured chocolate. So remember, as we discussed, after it finds this Tim Tam bar, where does it put it? It's a little quiz time. What did I say earlier? Oh, it puts it in its cloaca. Good, good. It's a sugary thing, so it goes right in the cloaca. Good, good. <laughs> I then had a thought, well, all right. If I want to establish that they're an alien, we talked about what they eat, but what do they taste like? That's another thought that I had, because I imagine that Aliens probably wouldn't taste good. That's just my thought. I don't, it's not backed up by anything. Or maybe they're like super delicious. All right. They might be. That was in an episode of Futurama and that, uh, the poplars. I don't know if you remember that. That's right. A good episode. So I couldn't find a cooked platypus image anywhere. Internet, you've let me down. One of the reasons why is that they're endangered. So if you were to ever prove that you killed a platypus, it's about $6,000 for a fine. What if you found a platypus that was already dead and then cooked it? I know, and I thought that I'd be able to find that, and I couldn't. There's no images of Gordon Ramsay eating platypus, no Anthony <laughs> Bourdain, nothing. Who's that Who's that Australian billionaire that keeps going to space? Um, uh, Richard Brand? Yes. Richard? He probably has like eaten that. some. Branson. He's probably eaten some of those, yeah. right? Why can't he just like eat the fine, you know, like he can afford to he eat could definitely platypus. eat the fine. So that's why I showed a cake here. Um, Cause it's probably a lot better than what a platypus tastes like. So 
I looked it up, and the only evidence I could find were two historical entries from the 1800s about what a platypus tasted like. And this deserves something else. This is what we call the comedic matters oopsie of the day. All right, why is this an oopsie? It's embarrassing, that's why. Because there's no definitive answer. I found two and they both contradict each other. All right, so this is from Scribner's Magazine in 1993. The platypus would more than cause indigestion to the average Caucasian. That's a fancy way of saying that was gross, right? Fancy way of saying Or maybe it was like delicious, it. but it causes, it causes stomach upset. Mm. All right, so that's the first one. It sounded like not too pleasant. The second one. I bet they ate the poison sack. Maybe they, yeah, maybe it's like a blowfish. You got to eat the right part of it. This one came from Samuel Lockwood, 1888. The cadaver was cooked and some tea was brewed and the roasted duck mole was pronounced good. Again, very fancy way of talking, right? Uh, talk to the average American right now and they'd say, I like shoving stuff in my mouth, right? It's. Did the second person, was it confirmed that they were also white? Yes. Because the first Lockwood. one, oh, okay. So that's but an, maybe they weren't civilized. Maybe that's the difference. Mm, that might be the trick. So there's my kind of oopsie for the day. We usually make fun of other people, but I'm making fun of myself because I can't tell you definitively if it tastes good or bad. I looked for one, nothing on eBay, nothing. So I apologize to my crew. If anybody of you out there has tasted a platypus, let us know. All right. But let's be honest, everything else about the creature is weird, so it probably tastes weird. Right? It probably tastes like a combination of like jelly beans and, I don't know, mud. Let's talk a little bit more milk. We're going from cake to milk. I thought that made a little sense. So here's something else weird. The milk may actually save humanity. Because they don't have teats, they concentrate the milk on their belly, their belly right? And it goes down their little V and it goes to the... Um, goes to the babies because they didn't have teats and teats are usually a way to keep your milk sterile and clean. Platypus is actually developed accidentally, right? A way to keep their milk safe through a very protective defense system. So it's got super antibacterial proteins in their milk so that when it drips down the V and probably mix it mixes with, let's be honest, fecal matter, or whatever comes out the cloaca, probably mixes with all this stuff, and their babies eat it, so they needed to develop some kind of defense mechanism in their milk. So humans think that we can use this, and there's lots, lots of talk because there's a highly unusual structure in the platypus milk that we can, can actually fight off things much like our own penicillin. So scientists are really I'm, excited about this. I'm allergic to penicillin. Cancer? You're allergic to penicillin. Well, then you better find a platypus and drink its milk, Cody. But yeah, if know, it's I like penicillin, too. well, does it's, that what mean... if you're both also allergic to platypus? I don't think you will be because it works like penicillin, but it's not doesn't have the same stuff in it. That's why scientists mm. are excited. It's like an alternative to kill bacteria, and that's according to popsci.com, which sounds legit to me. All right. Finally, what does something need to be considered to be to be an alien? Right. So I figure, why not? show you this. If this doesn't convince you that the platypus is an alien, I don't know what would. Anybody have a guess this as to what's... This is real, right? Yeah. Anybody have a guess as to what's this called? What this creature is called? Uh, uh, platy pl horse? Platy horse? Yeah. Close. Really close, Kate. Maybe you could work together. Cody, can you build off of that? Uh, what else looks like a horse? Uh, a goat. Plata goat. No. All right. Plata, Plata Sci stallion? Really close. Sylvester you're both, Stallone? You're both close. The Plata pony. It's called the Plata pony. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not real, but I do, I did want to show it because it's funny and it's related to this next part. According to Britannica, if you're talking about alien as in, you know, something from outer space, it is life that may exist or may have existed in the universe outside of Earth. That's really all it means. So it doesn't mean it has to be super advanced. Doesn't need to fly UFOs 
It doesn't need to know teleportation. It just needs to be life that may exist outside of Earth, the universe outside Does of Earth. Does that mean that our astronauts are aliens because they've existed in space? Life that may, absolutely. That's what I get from that definition. I'm probably mis, misreading it, but absolutely. So maybe a platypus was just chilling out on an asteroid. Asteroid crashes into Earth. Suddenly the platypus is here. That could be an alien, right? Doesn't mean UFO. Now, I know that's a stretch. All right, we joke a lot. I know that's a stretch. But if you don't want to rule that it's that kind of an alien, let me tell you what other kinds of aliens there are in this world, right? It could mean a foreigner, right? So if we talk about the other kind of alien, it could mean a foreigner, especially one who's not naturalized as a citizen of the country where they're living, right? So I'd argue that even amongst the madness of Australia, the platypus is so weird that maybe it would be considered an alien in that regard, right? It's foreign. It doesn't belong. It doesn't look very natural to me, the platypus. So if we get that, the word alien and the, the common usage of it, there's even another definition, and that's used in more of the kind of adjective sense, right? That's alien to me, right? That's alien. And that could mean, that could mean something like strange or frightening or different than you're used to. So it doesn't have to be that kind of an alien that I'm jokingly showing you pictures of. It could be the other kind of an alien, right? It could be. So just think about it. So yes, I'm doing my best dirty lawyer move to make this show interesting, but at least I'm honest, right? At least I'm honest. It'll add some excitement. If you watched it this far, you might think they're not going to rule that platypus is an alien. Well, now I've complicated the matter because there are other types of alien, right? Not just one. So that's all the new information I have to present to you. So hopefully you can mull that over, think about it. Let's give ourselves a time to take a breather. Let's think about Cody and those, those, those platypus pictures maybe. Get a little breather. Think, think a moment. A little bit of a refresh. Why not show that again? Show that again. All right, I think we're good. All right. So folks, the way this works, we need to decide if the platypus is an alien. Now at the beginning, I asked, is the platypus an alien that exists outside of outer space, right? But I really want you to answer, is the platypus an alien? However you interpret it. All right, everybody. So now it's time. We have to finally decide on if the platypus is an alien or not. So what I want you to do is, Write it down somewhere. Is the platypus an alien? If you think yes, write down alien. If no, say no. I can't wait to hear what we say because whatever we say will be the truth. Cody, Kate, are you ready? Do you have your answer locked in? Right. Okay, here we go. Whenever you hear the high, the, the crash of the cymbal and this drum, drum roll, reveal your answer. Here we go. Alien. Oh, Cody went third party. Science experiment. So there's the answer, folks. You're welcome, Earth. We have ruled that the platypus is an alien. Write it down. It's the truth. All right, everybody. Well, that wraps up today's episode of the Comedic Matters podcast. I had a lot of fun while learning about the unquestionably weird platypus today and where the hell it came from. Thank you very much, panel. We did great work. We have big plans for the Comedic Matters podcast, and with your support, we'll be able to upgrade, expand, and even make more content, because we know you want more. Head on over to the Comedic Matters podcast Patreon link to become a member of the Matter Mob. As a member of the Matter Mob, you'll get exclusive access to extra shows, behind-the-scenes looks, especially at Cody, and other goodies. We'll see you next time, everybody, and until then, stay weird, stay wacky, and remember to coat you and your loved ones with platypus repellent on the daily, because you never know. Goodbye, everybody.